hello once again, everybody. It is a delight to see everybody. Hi, my name is Eric Bucci, and I am the lead pastor here at Cornerstone Church. Thank you so much for joining with us today, and everyone that's watching online as well. If this is your first time here, if you've not been here in a long time, can you guys do me a big, big favor and let everyone know how much you love them, nice and loud. Let's welcome everybody. Well, it is a delight to see everyone here today. This is a quick uh, few things. You heard about Ukraine, and we have an opportunity to make a difference. We are partnering with um, Convoy of Hope, which is a tremendous organization. We're partnering with them. And so what we're doing, everybody, is that we uh, purchased. Thank, first of all, I want to thank you for your generosity. I want to thank you uh, for all that you have done. Before Christmas, we had a situation in India, and you all came through, raised over $35,000 to help with auctionators and all that, and it's fantastic. And uh, we thank you for that. And also, you've been amazing in this whole process of Ukraine. We've raised so far $30,000, so thank you so much. And this is above and beyond. And what we're doing, we need about 42 to 43, um, another 12,000 would be able to finish what we need to do. What we're doing is we're putting relief kits together to support 6,000 people, refugees in Ukraine. And so what we're doing is we order the uh, material. It's coming in big pallets. Over 20 pallets are coming to our church. We're believing by the 31st, and by uh, April the 2nd, which is next Saturday, we're going to put an assembly line out in our foyer area, our commons, and we're going to put together these 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 gift pa- uh, these um, relief kits for people. And so we're going to put 6,000 together, but we need some folks to help. So if you want to help out and you want to bring your children to help out, you can sign up online because we want to make sure we have different shifts so no one gets lost in the mix. We want to make a difference. And if you want to help out or tell your neighbors or your friends, this is for Ukraine, and this is an amazing organization. We're going to have a shipping container that we're going to be brought over here and use forklifts, fill it up, and then we're going to ship it over to your, uh, to Poland and distribute it to uh, the refugees that are stuck in Ukraine and Romania and other things of that nature. So that's what we'll be doing. So thank you, everybody, for that. I really appreciate it. I really do. And it, it warms my heart to know that together we can make a difference. And uh, we've had people come up uh, to our door a little while ago and said, will you please hang the, the Ukrainian flag, um, flag? And I told them what we're doing, and they were, had tears in their eyes. They said, you don't know how much that means to us that your church is a part of making a difference. So Cornerstone, thank you for caring. Thank you for having a heart of Jesus. Thank you. Also, uh, in a few moments, I have my friend come up, and he's going to share uh, on, the, on the Sermon on the Mount. But before we do that, Easter is coming up. So we want to encourage you to invite your friends to come. Uh, according to statistics, people will come even more on special days. We have five worship opportunities, and uh, the most famous or probably the most popular are Sunday mornings. So if you can make maybe come to the 3 or 4 o'clock on the day before, or if you invite your friends, give them one of these cards and invite them to come. Also, we want to be praying for our friends and ones we're going to ask. We're going to ask you to ask five people. We're going to give you these cards. You can fill their names in the front of it and also in the bottom, and then tear it off, keep the five names for yourself, and put the other five names in the offering boxes. And our prayer team, we're going to lay hands on them, and we're going to pray, and we're going to believe God for a great amount of people to come to know Jesus Christ for the first time or come back home to him over the Easter holiday season. So we're excited about that, okay? We are in the middle of a series called the Sermon on the Mount, which is Jesus' amazing, absolutely amazing sermon where he talks about how you and I is an upside-down kingdom. All the things you think are correct, Jesus has a better way. It's a life-giving series, and I'm so happy to have my dear friend, Pastor David Ferranti, to come here and to help us with our series. It's kind of a part of our house and uh, I've known him since 2002. I went out to California to spend uh, a week with Dr. Jack Hayford, one of my heroes of the faith, and uh, a man that has lived his life with integrity. And we went out for four different times together. We became good friends. And he's been a great friend to us here at Cornerstone Church. He's seen my family grow. He's seen his church family grow. Him and Cheryl began Bay City church uh, over 30 years ago. Now he has an international leadership uh, teaching he does. He has a retreat center, and he also raises up leaders, and he pastors the church. Will you please welcome back my dear friend, Pastor David Ferranti. Thank you. Appreciate you, Pastor. We'll get that table. Awesome. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, Glad to see the Cornerstone family again, and uh, let me just start with a quick story. 
Uh, Jimmy and Johnny were at home, and they were invited to spend the night at their grandparents' house. Thanks, Pastor. And uh, while they were at the grandparents' house, uh, they went to bed, and uh, they said their prayers. And uh, so Jimmy, the youngest one, probably about five years old, starts to pray. Lord, I want a bicycle. Lord, thank you for my bicycle. And he kept going on and on. And his brother Johnny looked at him and said, why are you so loud? Why are you yelling? God's not deaf. He says, yeah, but Grandpa is. <laughs> it is a delight to be with you. We're so thankful to watch. Uh, I've literally, I feel like I'm getting to be the old guy around here, the uh, older brother he calls me. But I've watched him and Sandy and all the kids grow up. We, we met uh, before Matt, I think, was... Well, he was pretty close if he wasn't uh, not born yet. And so we've watched the church develop. We came initially from the old building. Uh, we shared uh, information about an architect, and that architect came and helped build this church. He helped us in Michigan. And so just lots of neat things that we've connected with over the years. And so I'm just very uh, honored to be a friend. Uh, I know Pastor Bucci loves uh, his family. He loves the church. He loves God. And, and you really can't say much more than that because... Um, we all have different gifts and abilities, but we, when we learn to appreciate and respect each other, uh, teamwork really does make the dream work. And so I'm very thankful for Pastor Rich this morning. I was watching him since I got here. He works that network of the foyer, uh, giving care, sitting on couches, drinking coffee. I, I like to have a ministry like that, right? <laughs> Sit down, drink coffee, ha hang out with each other. It was, it's really been fun to watch. And then uh, uh, Pastor John up here leading worship with the team. And just, a, I think I got, I preached last time before he was even here. I think you were in between. And so it's been fun to watch the worship team. And then, of course, they put this big screen up behind me that's awesome. Uh, I, I have a little envy, but I'm working on my jealousy stuff on the big screen because I don't have one of those. But it's really cool to watch how God has been growing this church. Well, I'm part of a, this series that Pastor Bucci's been speaking on. He asked me to participate this week on the subject. And so let me just begin with Matthew chapter 5, verse 18. He says, I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For surely I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, uh, one jot or t one tittle will by no means pass away from the law until it is fulfilled. So God's plan really is that, that uh, you and I would have an encounter with him and he would open our spiritual eyes, he would open our spiritual ears, uh, that we would... Get born again, according to John chapter 3. When we get born again, we're led, to as many as are led by the Spirit, they are the children of God. So the idea here was, before I was a Christian, I, was, uh, uh, I, didn't, know the, you know, I didn't know the difference between the book of Job uh, or the book of Job and the book of Palms. I didn't know the Bible at all. I was a young Catholic guy who grew up, and uh, uh, so I would go to church, well, at least Christmas and Easter, and um, that was the extent of my faith. So I didn't really know the Bible. I didn't know there was 39 books in the Old Testament and 27 in the New Testament, that there's 66 different books that were compiled into one. We're going to talk more about that today. But that, what I did understand that when, when people get born again across the world, there's four things that usually happen when someone says yes to Christ. Number one, uh, they begin to pray like they never prayed before. They begin to talk to God out of relationship, not of rules or not just a memorized verse. I can do the memorized stuff. I did learn that. You know, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. I, I memorized that as a kid. Now I lay me down to sleep. Remember that one? Pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul. I, I learned those. as But something happened at 18. And it wasn't just what I could memorize or what I knew. Something began to happen in my heart. And I remember uh, riding my bicycle in Arizona from my, where I worked to go to school. And while I'm riding my bike, the Holy Spirit, I, I don't know how to explain it to you, but his love filled my heart. And I started praying like I'd never prayed before. Some called it the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I just began to pray like I'd never prayed before. And it was just as if God kissed me and said, David, I love you. I'm like, wow, what was that? And it changed my life forever. So I began to worship uh, like I never worshiped before. I, my, I didn't know what worship was. I wasn't at a church yet. And they'd never worship like this in the Catholic church. But I had both hands up on a bicycle, going down the mountain, which meant no hands on the bars, right? I'm just praising God, thanking God for his grace and his love and, and that he had a purpose and a plan for my life because his love messed me up in a really powerful way. I began to worship, I began to pray. The next thing that happened to me, and some of you understand this, I couldn't shut up. I had to tell everybody that Jesus had a plan, that he loved them, and that he was willing to do whatever it took. If you draw near to God, the Bible says he'll draw near to you. Well, it went from that, and then finally, the scriptures came alive. I don't know how to explain it to you, but
But all of a sudden, I didn't have to read the Bible. I wanted to read the Bible. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. I began to understand that my, I had a carnal mind and I had a, a, a Bible mind, which meant the more I meditated on his word day and night, I found out that God provided a way of escape from every temptation. So God's word became alive and active, sharper than a two-edged sword, helping me to navigate my way through life as a teenager. Well, there are many books today that claim to be the word of God. The Koran is the Islam holy book, claims to be the word of God. The Book of Mormon claims to be the word of God. The Hindus believe in the Bhagavad Gita, which is a source of eternal truth. And of course, Karl Marx, with an atheist worldview, claiming his writings, the Communist Manifesto, uh, is ultimate truth. So you've got lots of people saying they're the word of God, but I want to talk to you today about six evidences, uh, three internal and three external evidences. And um, you've got to love those kids, don't you? I just, we just love them to death. I could have five more, but my wife said two is enough, and they're in their 30s now, so I can't do that anymore. Well, she can't do that anymore. One of us can't do it anymore. Anyway, love those kids, okay? I uh, stepped into that one. All right, so let's go. We Christians believe that the Bible to be the Word of God and the eternal source of truth that we live by. How do we know the Bible is the Word of God, and can we actually prove that the Bible is truly the Word of God? And of course, the answer is absolutely, let me hear, yes, rule out, yes, and we're going to go through some things today. I don't have a, a lot of time to unpack this fully, but I'm going to try to give you as much as I can in the next few moments. So before I begin uh, the discussion of the authority of the Bible, let me first quote uh, the words of Jesus found in uh, John chapter 15, verse 18. Jesus warns his disciples about the attitude that the world will have towards uh, those who follow him. Jesus says, if the world hates you, Keep in mind that it hated me first. You've got to remember, the world is in rebellion against God. So you don't get mad at people that don't know the Lord. You don't kick blind people. They can't see it. And so what we have to do is model it. We have to be the kind of Christians that the Holy Spirit leads us, not by our flesh, but by the Spirit, so that they see us actually, uh, I, I love what John said this morning, that we are, we're known by his love his disciples should be known by his love. So it's not just love in theory. It's that we're operating and motivated by love for others. He says, if the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. If you belong to the world, it would have loved you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8 states this. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. So if you're going to affect the people, God presented his word to the Israelites. And one of the reasons why we pay for, pray for the peace of Jerusalem and pray blessings on them is because God used those people to give them his word and then the word was, was written in their Hebrew language and then spread to the Greek language. And so the word of God literally has been preserved all these years that you and I have a copy of the Bible today. I mean, this is, this is an amazing, amazing story. Let me give you a quick example. Uh, one guy in, the, in a book called uh, How the Bible Became a Book wrote this story, and he said, here's what happened. He said, pretend for a moment that all of us would go take sledgehammers and go to the Statue of Liberty. Break it up into small pieces and send those pieces all over the world. Wait 1,500 years, and everybody at the same time sends those pieces back together, and we can put it back together exactly like it was put down. I mean, it would be a miracle. But this is how the scriptures have been preserved and put together for us today. Some people say, well, Pastor Dave, you know, there's different versions of the Bible, and there's different, there's different uh, uh, ways to... Listen, the Holy Spirit is our guide and our teacher. So you take the Word of God that we have, and you take the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit will make His Word come alive to you, and it will actually, which is pretty amazing, He becomes our teacher so that He can teach you from the Spirit what the Word of God is and what it means. What is vital to understand from these passages is the attitude of the world towards God. The world is in rebellion against God, and worldly people under the influence of Satan seek to destroy your faith. In light of times that we live in, it's important to Christians not only to know what they believe, but why they believe what they believe. I, I've got to teach my kids. I've got to teach my, my grandkids. Now, I've got a grandbaby coming. It's the first time I've ever said that publicly. I've got a grandbaby coming in October which will be my first one, so it makes me an old guy. 
But the, but the concept here is I don't just tell them what to do. Don't do this. Don't do this. Don't do this. Don't do this. I want them to know why. When God's love filled my heart, I didn't have to read the Bible. I wanted to read the Bible. Now, at first, before I was a Christian, you know, I got to be honest with you. You know why I went to church? When I went to college, I looked for churches who had food. So the Catholics had a good fish fry on Fridays, you know what I'm saying? And the Methodists had a great uh, potluck on Tuesday, and, and I would find all these different churches that had meals, and that's how a college student was able to, to eat pretty well back in those days, as I went to churches to find the food. And then I found out in the Bible that Jesus was the bread of life, and that we could, we could come and he would feed us spiritually. And it began to make a transition. But here's what I know. College-bound students, I once heard an astounding statistic. It indicates that 80% of the college-bound students who profess to be Christians leave from school, leave for school, and return home no longer believing in Christ. One of the reasons is that when a student sits in class and hears the professor discredit the Bible, the student doesn't have a defense and is easily deceived into believing the Bible is no longer credible. Well, I remember receiving Jesus. I didn't know much about life. I didn't know much about the Bible. But in my first psychology class in college, my, my professor got up and said, listen, we all came from monkeys. And he's running around showing us the mating habits of the ostrich. <laughs> and he says, and, and so inside, I don't know how to say it. I didn't know how to defend myself, but I knew that I knew that I knew that God created me. And that God had a plan. I, so I stood up in class and I gave my testimony. See, people can debate you and fight with you and disagree with you, but they cannot have a debate for your testimony. And I said, listen, my life was, 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 was separated from God. I lived my own way, controlled by my own fears, my own lust. But when I received Christ, I began to worship, I began to pray, I began to have a passion for the Bible, and I began to share my faith with other people. So what you're saying is you might be a monkey, is what I said back then. I said, but I'm not. I was fearfully and wonderfully made in my mother's womb, and, and I don't know what happened to you. Now, over the years, I get a little more polished. You know, I take some of that hard rub, you know. <laughs> it reminds me of the young girl. She uh, is in class, and her teacher uh, in, the, in the public school says, you know what, Jonah could not be swallowed by a whale. It's not possible. And they're, they're debating. And she says, and he just can't be, he, he, he was too, he's too big to go into a whale's mouth. And, she's, and the girl said, no, he did. The Bible says he did. And then all of a sudden, the, the teacher says, well, or the girl said to the teacher, you know, um, I'm sorry, the teacher said to the girl, uh, <laughs> wait a second. The girl said to the teacher, well, I'll, I, when I get to heaven, I'm going to ask uh, uh, where God about Noah or about Jonah. My all messed up now. So the little girl looks at her and she said, um, well, what if there's no heaven? The little girl looked at her teacher and said, well, then you ask him. <laughs> Did you catch that one? You got it? <laughs> teacher not in heaven. Anyway. Okay, I just took up five minutes I shouldn't have. All right, let's keep going. In my experience, there's no book that has been criticized and attacked more than the Bible. Many intelligent scholars have written books and attempt to discredit the authority of the Bible. This is one of Satan's goals to get man to doubt. Now, here's what I know. We're all going to have doubts in our faith. We all have moments when we doubt certain things about God. But the challenge that we have is when I doubt, I need to minimize my doubts and increase God's word in my life. So I can't deny doubts, but I can have God's word in me so that I can be able to, to take every thought captive and bring it into uh, captive, into the word of God. So all of a sudden, I'm trying to help people as I, as I travel around the country, as we travel around the world, and we've traveled several countries with uh, Pastor Bucci. The idea there is we want people to understand that the word of God can transform and change people's lives, and it does all over the world. There has not been in history of, of the of, of man, a book that has rocked the world as the Bible has. The impact has made, fun, it's, it's just been supernatural, how God has been able to use the word. Did you ever hear the Gideon story? Where people are, uh, they go to a hotel room and they open the uh, little desk next to them, the little dresser next to them, and they open the door and they pull out the Bible and they're getting ready to take their life. And they start reading the Bible verse and all of a sudden, they put the, they put the Bible down and, and get on their knees and pray to God and say, God, I want to know you. 
The Bible has been uh, used all over the world to gather attention because the Bible says when you draw near to him, he draws near to you. So, and many other works that claim to be the Bible or the word of God, can we know that the Bible is the true word of God? Absolutely. So let me give you three evidences internally and three externally if I can get done in about 10 minutes. All right, here we go. First one is self-proclamation. The Bible says that it's the word of God. The first fact in the Bible claims to be the Word of God, and the authors knew that they were writing the words of God, even though they often did not fully understand what they were writing. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, here's what it says. All Scripture is inspired by God. 2 Peter chapter 1, 21 states, No prophecy has ever been made by the act of, of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. And Jesus himself viewed the Old Testament as the authoritative and, and quoted it from, uh, throughout his ministry. So the first thing I want you to know is the Bible, number one, says that it is the Word of God. Number two, uh, the Holy Spirit confirms to us that the Bible is the Word of God. John 16, verse 13 says it this way, But when he, the Spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. So now the Holy Spirit then, this is why you have to be born again, because natural man can't understand the things of God. So when you get born again, it's not just that you see a history book on your desk, 66 different books, by the way, that were compiled into one, the Holy Spirit begins to open your spiritual eyes, and that's why I say to people, don't, don't judge and criticize people who aren't Christians. You don't kick blind people, you've got to help them understand it, and the best way to understand, help them understand, listen, is for you to be a model of it. You need to be the only Bible someone will ever read at times because people today aren't reading the Bible like they used to. And Christians who are reading and meditating on God's Word are learning to live a different way. The Holy Spirit who convicts the world of sin also assures the believer that the Bible is God's Word. That was something that happened internally. It wasn't someone on the outside that told me that. It was the Holy Spirit on the inside of me that helped me begin to see that this is a supernatural thing, not just a natural thing. Number three, transforming ability. We have evidence concerning the transforming ability of the Bible. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12 says it this way. Here's what it says. The word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword and piercing as far as the division of soul and marrow. Romans chapter 12, 1 and 2, or 2 verse, verse 2. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So here's the problem. Trying to be a Christian today without the Bible uh, is, is ludicrous. You cannot uh, be a Christian. Listen, you say, I want to get closer to Jesus. How do you get closer to Jesus? You meditate on his word day and night that you may not sin against him. You know the Bibles provide a way of escape from every temptation? Only if you know the word of God because the word of God will give you options that you wouldn't have in the natural man. So all of a sudden, I began to, I, I hear people all the time, well, Pastor Dave, it's just so hard to be a Christian today. Well, it's hard because you're so full of the world. When you get filled full of him, you want the things of God. You, you, you leave the appetites that you used to have, and you have new appetites. Now all of a sudden, I'm worshiping, and I'm praying, and I'm reading the scriptures, and I'm telling people about Jesus. A lot of Christians today are not experiencing the joy of the Lord like God intended because they're not doing what God asked them to do, and that was to go tell the world about him. When you lift him up, the Bible says he'll draw all men unto you. So do you want your life to be enriched and, 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 and transformed? Commit yourself to living the scriptures and allow him to lead you and guide you. The craziest things have happened in my life, not because I was so smart, but because I heard a whisper from heaven. One whisper from heaven can change the course of your life. And all of a sudden, when God speaks and you listen and you discern because you've been meditating on his word, things begin to happen that could never happen in the natural man. We have evidence concerning the transforming ability of the Bible. Listen to this. The word of God and the spirit of God actually transform the lives of people. So when I was a brand new Christian, the first thing that happened in my life was, number one, I began to believe in the Bible. Number two, I went to a church and, and uh, they said, well, we believe in the Bible, but we don't believe in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And then I'd go to some churches and they believed in the Spirit, but they just kind of take a, kind of a slack approach on the Word of God. And what I realized is we need both, not one or the other. We need to be fully committed to the scriptures, but we need, need to be led by the spirit. And when the, the, the word and the, the, the spirit of the Lord and the word come together, there's power. 
The Bible has changed the lives of murderers, drug addicts, top government officials, business people, the students, to name just a few, from every walk of life who have been transformed. No other book can make such a claim. This is because the Bible is not a mere book on good living, but is literally packed with power. If the Word of God, uh, it is the Word of God with the power to change lives. So we're not trying to get people to come to church because that's church entity. We're trying to get people filled with God's Spirit, their eyes open, their ears, they become part of a, a movement across the world. And there's believers in the Ukraine, there's believers all over the world, every continent, God is saying, listen, when I come back, I am going to, to reach the largest harvest of souls the planet's ever seen. So if you want to stay on the couch and be comfortable and not come to, because there's a lot of people that, well, I don't want to go to church anymore, I don't want to do this anymore, I don't want to read the Bible anymore, then you've got to really begin to ask, is the Spirit of God living in you? Because what He does is He wants to open your eyes, open your ears, and help you to participate in the greatest move on planet Earth. He's moving by His Spirit. To as many as are led by the Spirit, they are the children of God. How do you know you're part of it? When I, when I was a teenager, no one had to convince me to go to church. No one had to convince me to read the Bible. No one had to tell me to pray because it was a relationship and I wanted God more than I wanted the things of this world. These are only three internal evidences supporting the actual, the authority of the Bible. These, of course, are not the best arguments if I was in a debate. But for today's message, we're saying to you that God is at work. The scripture says it's the word of God that it has the power to transform our lives, and that uh, the Holy Spirit becomes our guide and teacher. It makes it come alive. So let's take a look at... Yep, I got about four minutes. All right, here we go. Uh, let's move down here. If we... Um, you like this. Uh, it was written under many different circumstances, the Bible. David wrote during a time of war. Jeremiah wrote in sorrowful time of Israel's downfall. Peter wrote with, while Israel was under Roman domination, and Joshua wrote while invading the land of Canaan. Fifth, the writers had different purposes for writing. Isaiah warned Israel of God's coming judgment on their sin. Matthew wrote to prove the Jews that Jesus was the Messiah. Zechariah wrote to encourage a disheartened Israel who had returned from Babylon, Babylonian exile. And Paul wrote addressing problems in different Asia and European churches. So the whole idea is that over a 1,500-year span, God used kings and shepherds and tax collectors uh, and, and put them together, wrote 66 different books, 39 in the Old Testament, 27 in the New, and began to give us something that we could actually meditate on to help us reach uh, all the way to the end when Jesus returns. If we put all these factors together, the Bible was written over 1,500 years by four, listen to this, 40 different authors at different places under various circumstances and addressed a multitude of issues. It is amazing that with such diversity, there is such unity in the Bible. People are always trying to attack it. People are always trying to say, well, what about this? What about that? How about this? Well, listen to this. I'm not trying to convince you alone in your human natural mind that the Bible is true. I'm trying to get you to move out of your natural man and receive Christ so that he can convince you that the Bible is alive and real. God's redemption of man and of all creation, hundreds of controversial subjects are addressed, and yet the writers do not contradict each other. That's like that... Uh, example that I gave you. Let me give you three quick external evidences about this. First of all, uh, the indestructibility of the Bible. Now, when the men first went to the moon, by the way, they put the Bible in outer space. It was on microfilm. And uh, the Bible was, was <laughs> it's so amazing. You remember when, they, when we didn't have a telephone yet, the Bible was transmitted uh, from one part of the country to another part of the country during the, like the Pony Express days. God has been using his word to reach men, women, boys, and girls uh, for thousands of years, and it has the power today to transform and change our lives. This first evidence is indestructibility of the Bible. The Bible is most well-known book in history of the world, and no book has been attacked more. Skeptics have tried to destroy the authority of the Bible for the last 1,800 years, uh, and it's undergone every kind of scrutiny possible from archaeology to science from philosophy and computers, yet despite all the attacks, the Bible, listen to this, the Bible itself is to be true again and again and again uh, as people have put it under the kind of scrutiny. The next part that you need to understand is uh, we regularly take trips to Israel. 
And one of the things I love about Israel is that the archaeological digs that they're doing today are so amazing. And every day it seems like they find new archaeological uh, uh, things, artifacts, that prove that the Bible's true. So the second source of external evidence comes from archaeology. Middle Eastern archaeology investigations have proven the Bible to be true and an unerring accurate in its historical description. Nelson Gullick, a renowned Jewish archaeologist, states this, no archaeological discovery has been ever controverted, uh, uh, has never been controverted uh, from a biblical reference. No one's ever proved it to be wrong. Dr. William Albright, who was not a friend of Christianity, was probably the foremost authority in the Middle East archaeology in his time, said that the Bible, uh, said this about the Bible, there can be no doubt that archaeology has confirmed the substantial historical evidence of the Old Testament. We could go on and on. In the 1960s, uh, the Ebla tablets were discovered in northern Syria. The Ebla kingdom was a powerful kingdom in the 20th century B.C., and so they did this study. They found all these five cities uh, that they thought was a myth and were able to confirm through the scriptures that these towns actually existed. Another example was the story of Jericho. Um, and I won't go into it because I'm running out of time. But the walls in Jericho, most, most places fell in, uh, uh, but this, the walls fell out and they found proof of it so that the uh, Israelites would actually be able to climb over the, the debris and actually get inside. Listen to this one. In March 5th, 1990, the issue of Time Magazine featured an article called Score One for the Bible. It is an archaeological, it was archaeologist Kathleen Kenyon claimed Jericho's walls had fallen suddenly, and she did that whole study. So the next one that you need to understand is prophecy. Okay, so we go from archaeology, and we could spend days on that one, but now I want you to go and listen to this. There are many more external evidences for the Bible. But I just want to cover uh, one more. The Bible contains hundreds of prophecies which have, gone, have come to pass. No book in history has ever come close to the Bible when it comes to the fulfillment of prophecy. The prophecies in the Bible were very specific and accurate. Some people say, well, wait a minute. What about Nostradamus? Nostradamus claimed to have made hundreds of prophecies that have, that have come true. But if you read his prophecies, you will find them to be vague and unclear. His symbols and language can be taken to mean a number of historical events. Unlike many such prophecies, biblical prophecy is very specific. Let me just give you one example and I'll wrap things up. Here are some of the examples. Ezekiel 26, which was written in 587 BC. Ezekiel prophesies that the mighty city of Tyre uh, could be destroyed. Tyre was made up of two parts, a mainline port city uh, and an island city half a mile offshore. Ezekiel predicted the mainland, Tyre, would be destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar and many nations would fight against her. The debris of the city would be thrown into the ocean and the city would never be found again and fishermen would come to lay their nets. Now check this out. In 57 BC, Nebuchadnezzar destroyed the mainland city of Tyre. Many of the refugees of the city sailed to the island and the island of Tyre remained a powerful city until about 33 um, BC. However, Alexander the Great laid siege to Tyre, using the rubble of the mainland Tyre to build a causeway in the cities of Tyre. He then captured and completed the destroyed city. Today, Tyre is a small fishing town where fishing boats come to rest their nets as fishermen. Now, I was told this morning, there was a gentleman here in the service that came up and told me this. He said that Alexander the Great, when he uh, destroyed the city, was going to move on and take over Jerusalem. And some, uh, one of the, somebody came out with the scrolls and opened the scrolls and said, listen, you just fulfilled a prophecy. And he stopped right there. What am I trying to say to you? I'm trying to say to you that it's not by power, by might, but by my spirit, says the Lord. The word of God, not one jot, not one tittle, not one... He's saying, by my spirit, I'm going to get things done no matter how impossible it looks to men. What am I trying to say then? Self-proclamation. We're talking about the Holy Spirit today. We're talking about his transforming ability. We're talking about the unity of the scriptures and how they fit together and work together. The indestructibility, the archaeology, and prophecy. So now let me, let me just simplify what I'm trying to say as I close. As a young boy riding my bicycle down from work to go to school, 
Jesus came into my life and opened my eyes and helped me to worship like I'd never worshiped before. I began to pray like I'd never prayed before. I began to share my faith, not because I had to, because I just wanted, I, didn't, I couldn't keep it to myself. What, this was amazing news. That God loved me and had a plan for my life. And finally, we began to realize that the scriptures could come alive. Listen, God loves you. He's got a plan for you. He's not trying to train us to be professional Christians. He wants a relationship where the Bible isn't something that I have to read. It's something that empowers me and fuels me and gives me the needed, necessary skills to develop character that when I go through pressures and problems, my mom was burnt over 60% of her body in a house fire. And while she went through the fire, she would share with us kids about her faith, about how God loved her and had a plan for her. Have you, anybody else besides me gone through some stuff? Have you been through some things? God's word is not to keep you perfect. God's word, listen, is to go with you through everything that you go through and bring you out the other side. Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego was put into a fire. They looked into the fire and they saw a fourth man in the fire we believe to be a type of Christ. Jesus didn't promise a perfect life. He promised he'd go with you through it all. But the way that he does that, if you want to get closer to Jesus, you get closer to his word. You can rely on it. You can count on it. You can meditate on it. You can study it so it becomes part of you. I've taken many scriptures and put them into practice, and it changes my life. You know, when I go to a church, Pastor Bucci, a lot of times I'll go sit in the back every time because the scripture in the Bible said don't go to the front of the table, go to the back, that little scripture verse. I always sit in the back, and I can't tell you how many times I sit in the back, and then someone says, no, 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 why don't you come up here and sit up here with me? The scriptures work. And if you've got doubts, it's okay to have doubts, but get more scripture in you so you've got more word in you to overcome the doubts. Would you bow your heads with me? Some of you are here today and you go, what is that guy talking so fast and why is he doing this? Bottom line is this. God wants you to pray a new way. He wants you to worship another way. He wants you to read and meditate on the scriptures and he wants you to tell others about Jesus, but he didn't want you to do it in your own strength. He needs you to get born again. If you're here this morning, and you'd like to give your heart to Christ. You'd like to be forgiven of your sins. You'd like the word of God to come alive to you like never before. It comes, listen, with a surrendering heart that says, Lord, come here. When I count to three, I'm going to ask that you put your hand up in the air. I want to pray a prayer with you. One, two, you're saying, I just want to receive Christ to be forgiven of my sins. I want the scripture to be open. Ready? Three, put your hand up real quickly right now. Here, 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 here. Anybody else over here? I see your hands. One, two, three of you over there. Anybody over there? Would you but pray this prayer with me? Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Forgive me of my sins. Open my eyes. Unblock my ears. Let the word of God come alive in me. Lord, I believe that you died on the cross and you rose again to give me a new life. I receive you right now. Can we thank the Lord for all those that raised their hand this morning? Let's thank the Lord for them. Hey, we love and appreciate you. God's word is real and alive and it'll transform our world, but we got to meditate on it. Pastor? Thank you so much, Pastor David. I so much come out to thank God for my friend, Pastor David. And also, I want to thank God for you giving your life to Jesus. It's the best thing you could ever do. And uh, I'm telling you, it's wonderful. We want to help you. We're not a perfect people. Jesus never said, say a prayer and goodbye. He says, come, follow me. Cornerstone Church is a group of people, a community that follows Jesus together. We encourage each other. And so in the front pocket of your seat, there's these connection cards. I want to pull it out. If you're online, you can pull your phone out and you can text as well. Uh, which we'll do, but you can fit uh, on the bottom there, my decision today to give my life to Christ for the first time or renew my commitment. If you could put your name, number down, we promise you we're not going to bug you. We're just going to send you a letter and say thank you for doing this and give you some next steps. Also, you can come and tell some, tell some folks up front after this. I'll have some people here to pray for you for whatever you need. We see people get healed, by the way, uh, as they come up for prayer. And also in the back, the information desk as well. And if you want to do it through your phone, all you have to do is text 
belief to 860-499-4888. That's 860-499-4888. Okay, everybody? And before we leave here today, uh, we want to give you an opportunity to get back to the Lord. We don't put any pressure on anybody, but we know the Word of God is true. And I've always seen God meet all of our needs. We have some ways you can give. You can put it on the screen. We're trying to make it a little easier for you. Go ahead and put that up. That'd be fantastic. We have a little QR code as well. Uh, what you can do is take a picture of your phone and show that QR code. And uh, there it is. Put the QR code there, and it brings you right to where you need to go, and you can do it that way. And uh, this are our ties and our offerings. If you want to get beyond that to Ukraine, please put it in there as well. There are boxes in the back as you leave here today, or you can do it online. There's four different ways. Okay, everybody? Let's just um, take a few moments. I'm just going to say a, a benediction, which is a blessing over you. May the Lord bless you. May he keep you. May he shine his face upon you and give you peace and give you rest. Go in the strength and the power and the love of Jesus Christ. Amen.